Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of morning prayer. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name shall be great among the nations. And in every place incense shall be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Dearly beloved, we've come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to set forth his praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation and so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship him let us sit in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy most merciful god we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord has shown forth his glory. Come, let us adore him. Reading together the Jubilate. Be joyful in the land, all you, the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Psalm 71 is the psalm appointed for today. We'll read that together. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong rock a castle to keep me safe. You are my crag and my stronghold. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the clutches of the evildoer and the oppressor. For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence since I was young. I have been sustained by you ever since I was born. From my mother's womb, you have been my strength, 
my praise shall always be of you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first song of Isaiah. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. Therefore you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And on that day you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things, and this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy. For the Great One in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading comes from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy calm or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move, remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful, does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading together the third song of Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples. But over you the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your great gates will always be open, by day or night. They will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, 
the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call your wall salvation and all your portals praise. The sun will no more be your light by day. By night, you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your God will be your glory. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus began to speak in the synagogue at Nazareth. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage they got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, the title of my message today is What's Love Got to Do With It? And uh, you may remember that was a song that was released in 1984 by Tina Turner. Some of you know that well. Uh, and by the way, the message really has nothing to do with the content of the song and what Tina Turner says about love. You'll, you'll find that out. And I think it would be an understatement to say that there's a lot that we as Americans disagree on these days. We have disagreements about politics. We have disagreements about religion. We have disagreements about how to deal with the virus or how we don't deal with the virus. We have disagreements about which sports team is the best. But do you know one thing that most people can agree on, not just in America, but all over the world, is that we should love. Now, can we agree that most people would say that love is a good thing? So for us as Christians, we're actually commanded to love. Love for us is not an option. It's one of the primary things that is to characterize our response as Christians to others. Someone approached Jesus one day and said, Master, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God 
with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, those aren't helpful suggestions. Those are commands. Jesus says in John 13, and now I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Peter says in 1 Peter, above everything, love one another earnestly, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. Okay, so we can agree on that. That we as Christians understand that love is not just a a helpful suggestion, it's a command. It's how we as believers should behave toward one another and with those outside the church and we're told even with our enemies. But my question is this, what does love even mean? If we agree that we're to love and have different ideas or different definitions about what love is, then we've got a problem, don't we? So what is love from a Christian perspective? And number two, how are we to love? And you may say, well, that's great that we have these commands to love God and love others, but how are we to go about doing that in a way that pleases God and makes a difference in the world? I think that's a great question. So one of Paul's most valuable contributions is that he's actually answered this question for us, at least he has in part, in his wonderful chapter on love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is our New Testament lesson for today. Now we're going to get to this wonderful chapter in a moment, but let's first acknowledge a challenge that we who read and speak the English language have in this regard as it relates to this subject of love. And uh, before I try to spell it out, let me illustrate first. I love God. I love my wife. I love my dog. I love pizza. I love football. Do you see the challenge? (laughs) We've got one word for love. Now, hopefully, I don't love pizza and football the same way I love my wife. If I do, I'm in a heap of trouble. Perhaps I wouldn't get in trouble if I love my dog almost as much as I love my wife, but that's another issue altogether. So we've got a problem. But you see, the Greeks had no such problem. And by the way, if you don't know this, the New Testament was written in Greek. Now, the Greeks had quite a few words for love, and they all mean different things. However, there were three, really three, maybe four main words for love in the New Testament. One kind of love is philia love. This love is a kind of friendship love. It's the kind of love that that you have for your best buddy, whoever that is. This word for love is reflected in the name of the city, Philadelphia, which is the city of what? It's the city of brotherly love. And then there is the love of eros, love. Eros is a Greek word for romantic love or erotic love, passionate love. It's a love that's to be expressed between a husband and wife, for instance. And it would be inappropriate for me to express that kind of love for anybody else's wife. And finally, there is agape love. Agape love is the highest form of love. Agape love is unconditional love. Agape love is the love that God has for us. And when the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life, that's the word, agape 
that it uses for love. And so back to Paul's great chapter on love in 1 Corinthians 13. The problem with this chapter is that many people take it out of context. They have it read at weddings, which is great. Nothing wrong with reading this chapter at a wedding. I think we had it read at ours some 34 and a half years ago. But you see, if you never read the chapters that surround it, you really don't know what love has to do with the challenges the church was facing. What was their biggest challenge? Well, if you read this letter carefully, you see that the church has evidently elevated one particular spiritual gift, the gift of speaking in tongues, above all other spiritual gifts. So it seems if a believer in the church in Corinth in the first century spoke in tongues, that was evidence that you were truly a Christian and that you had arrived at a kind of perfected spiritual state. If you didn't speak in tongues, then you were relegated to the category of second-class Christian at best. At worst, that was an indication that you were not a Christian at all. So, I don't think it's hard to see how this kind of thinking might have led to all kinds of chaos and abuses in the church. And in this particular first century church, that's exactly what happened. Things got out of hand. And so Paul addresses this issue with some really potent teaching on the spiritual gifts, which is what we find surrounding 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But then you see sandwiched right between these two chapters on spiritual gifts in 12 and 14 is this marvelous chapter on love. And here's something that often surprises folks. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this great chapter on love, is not supposed to be sappy or tender or sentimental. It's meant to be a stinging rebuke to the way believers were living out their faith in this first century church in Corinth. You see, they weren't demonstrating true love toward one another. Listen to how it begins. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now I've got a little secret to share with you. Uh, On Sunday mornings for the past 25 years, perhaps it includes seminary as well, so it might, might have been 28 years, I've been in the practice of setting three separate alarms on Sunday morning so that I get up on time. I need to get up usually around 6 o'clock or 6.30 a.m. so that I'm dressed and ready to go and in the office by about 8.30 a.m. or so. Now, from time to time, I forget to turn off the other two alarms after my first alarm goes off. The other two are set to go off five or ten minutes after the first alarm. So this is not a problem right now since I live alone. It's not a problem, at least until my wife joins me in June. But what happens is that I'm out in the kitchen, sipping on a cup of coffee, and my wife is back in the bedroom, listening to this buzzing and clanging of my other two alarms that are going off, and she's saying, turn it off, turn it off. And sometimes it takes a while, because I can't hear it from the next room. And let's just say, she gets really annoyed when that happens. So what Paul is saying here is that you can possess extraordinary gifts. You can even have supernatural gifts. But if you don't have love, your offering to God is like this annoying buzzing, clanging, or ringing in people's ears. And they just can't turn it off. In other words, Paul is saying what you have to offer God is worse than annoying. It's worthless if you don't have love. So as Paul is imploring the members of the church in this first century city to love, 
Which of these three words that I outlined earlier is Paul using? Is it philia love? Is it eros love? Or is it agape love? Which is it? And this is where our English translations fall short because there's no way for you to tell if you don't have a Greek New Testament or a pastor like me that's able to tell you. So the word that Paul uses in the original language is agape. Again, agape is the highest form of love. It's unconditional, no strings attached love. It's the kind of love that God has for us. And so here's the way New Testament scholar Dr. Gordon Fee explains it. I think it's a a fantastic summary of how we're to love with an agape love. Listen to what he says. To act lovingly means, as in the case of Christ, actively to seek the benefit of someone else. For Paul, it is a word whose primary definition is found in God's activity on behalf of his enemies, which was visibly manifested in the life and death of Christ himself. To have love, therefore, means to be toward others the way God in Christ has been toward us. Isn't that a wonderful definition? Paul goes on in verse 2, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now, I think if I ask many of you the question, is it possible to have a belief in God and still not be a Christian? I think many would say, sure. Sure, it's possible to believe in God and not be a real Christian. After all, You may say the New Testament even says the demons believe in God, but we know that they're not true Christians. So you may say, well, yeah, that's possible. Many of you may also agree that it's possible to be someone who's been baptized and confirmed and not be a true Christian. For some, perhaps, baptism and confirmation were merely rituals and nothing more. They haven't been accompanied by faith. And so you may say, sure, someone can go to church, even go through the religious rituals and rites and still not be a true Christian. You may not have a problem with those two statements, but how about this? Would you say that someone may exercise spiritual gifts, like speaking in tongues and prophecy, and even gifts of miraculous healing, and not be a true Christian? Listen to what Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 7. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So there it is. Jesus is saying that you can exercise extraordinary spiritual gifts, but not be a true Christian because something's missing. You remember in the Gospels, Jesus gives the 12 authority to go out and cast out demons, and that's what they do. They're successful on many of their journeys. And they find themselves doing at least some of the same kinds of extraordinary things, miraculous things, that Jesus is doing. But do you know the name of one of those twelve who is doing extraordinary things for God? His name was Judas. It doesn't say at that point that he was being any less effective in his ministry than the other eleven. God was using him in extraordinary ways, just like the others. So... Was Judas a true Christian? No. Why? Because he lacked love. 
Again, to love is to actively seek the benefit of someone else. Did Judas actively seek the benefit of the other disciples? Did Judas actively seek the benefit of Jesus? And the answer is no. He actively sought his own benefit instead of the benefit of others. In short, the most important quality or characteristic of a Christian is that he or she is someone who loves. He or she is a person who actively seeks the benefit of others, not just those whom they like. After all, Scripture says love is not merely one quality or characteristic of God. It's fundamental to God's nature. The Bible says God is love. This chapter on love applies to all people at all places and all times. But it came about in the context of a church that was seriously lacking in terms of demonstrating love to others. So if love for others is the most important quality or characteristic of a disciple of Jesus, how are you doing in that regard? And not just with your friends or those who love you back. How are you doing in the love department with your enemies? How are you doing in the love department with those with whom you disagree or members of another faith system or members of another, another political party? How are you doing loving the way Christ loved? Not just with any kind of love, but with an agape love. I, for one, need God's help in that regard. And remember I said that's one thing agape love means. It means God's love. God's love. And there's no way that I can love that way with God's love, at least not consistently, without God's help. <laughs> what about you? Paul writes, as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, when the perfect comes, that's Jesus. The perfect is Jesus. Uh, the partial will pass away. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. One final thought. Faith hope and love. Why is love the greatest? Why is love the most important? Well, faith and hope are pretty important. They're pretty powerful. Well, it's because on the other side of eternity, when you get to heaven, faith and hope will have completely passed away. There'll no longer be any need for hope, for we will have obtained that for which we have hoped. No more faith, because the Bible defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. No faith, because you will be encountering the Lord Jesus face to face in all his glory. But we will have love for all eternity. We will have love. So walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Te Deum Laudamus. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father, all creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of, of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. 
Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you, Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all worship, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not shun the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. Together, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The Lord be with you and also with you. Together, let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Suffrages be. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day, we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy upon us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you, that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Grant us, O Lord, a sense of your comforting presence today for our residents and staff. Our community is dealing with uncertainty and anxiety during this time. We know that your perfect love cast out all fear and bring us, brings us that peace that passes all understanding. We ask that today you would grant us that peace. We pray that still hopes would continue to be a haven of peace and health of body, mind, and spirit. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Today we pray for the repose of the soul of Norma Perkins. From our chapel prayer list, we pray for Retta Miller, Marcine Thompson, Jane Moorfield, Mary Townsend, Jim Geddes, Ann Reed, Jim Martin, Jackie Williams, Lindsay Presley, Joyce McDonald, Harry and Sarah Parker, John Condy, Margaret Wyman, Duck Lomas, Nibby Boyle, Johnny Benton, Peggy Buchanan, and Tommy Gregory. We pray for the safety of our military, remembering especially Brian Dugan, Alexander and Isaac White, and Natalie White. And we celebrate birthdays this coming week of Mary Lynn McCaffrey, Henrietta Van Allersdale, Catherine Clark, Malcolm Fletcher, Patsy White, Betty Davis, Eleanor Moore, Sandra Williams, William Kitchens, and Therese Coons. Praying together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you in the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world the knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <clears throat>